he whispered in my ear, is your sermon going to be short? Now, that's an important question, isn't it? And uh, it will be shorter than usual because we have a busy day with communion, don't we? And so it will be a, a little shorter today. It'll only be about 45 minutes long. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's, that's supposed to be humorous. It'll be shorter than that. They were so concerned about getting their way. They were concentrating on being who they wanted to be. Each one of them wanted to be thought of more highly than the others. You would almost think that they were in some type of a popularity contest. They were acting as the rest of the world, but they supposedly had an advantage that should have prevented this maneuvering for position. What was the advantage? They had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus uh, and had more knowledge of Jesus than anyone else. They traveled with him. They ate with him. They, they uh, listened to him. They had private conversations with him. They could ask him any question that was on their mind, and they could do it face to face. Wouldn't that be nice? And yet, they didn't act like him. Now, Jesus is coming to the close of his life on this earth, and he's grieved at his disciples' lack of understanding of who they had been following these past three years. And a last chance presents itself. It's at, it's at the Passover feast. And the shuffle for position continues even at the table where the disciples gather together. Who's going to sit on the right hand? Who's going to sit on the left? And who's going to be next and next and next? And who's going to have to sit the farthest away? It won't be me. I'll get through the door first. I know where I'm sitting. The last thing on their mind, the last thing, it seems, that there was on their mind was being a servant. Can you picture them? Scooting into the upper room, okay, which is the head of the table. Let's watch where Jesus sits because uh, I don't know whether they had a designated head of the table. But they would find, wherever Jesus sat, that's where they wanted to be, right? there. Now, that's not a bad thing, is it, to sit next to Jesus? But they had a bad reason for it. Because they wanted to be most important. And uh, I can see them watching closely and then scurrying, almost like, uh, what's that game we play that when you take away the chairs? Musical chairs. It must have looked a little bit like musical chairs. And as soon as Jesus sat, quickly they would move over to see if they couldn't sit right next to him somehow. No servant to wash their feet. No one moves. The first person who moves loses their spot. And so no one wanted to be first. No one wanted to do that. Somebody watched, you know, as they watched looking around the table, they said, oh, maybe John's going to do it. No, he was just scratching his nose. He wasn't volunteering. Um, As they thought, we have just been talking about who is going to be the greatest and where we're going to sit. If I get up, I'll lose my spot. I imagine they took, they looked at whoever was seated at the foot of the table, wondering maybe that disciple would be the best one. He didn't have much to lose. You know, he was already at the foot of the table. I'm not budging, he may have thought. I've lost my spot at the head of the table. I'm not going to be the servant any more than this. 
to move means to lose. But while they were looking at the foot of the table, Jesus leaves the head of the table and he goes to the foot of the table, not just to the foot of the table, but to the foot and feet of the person at the foot of the table. Everybody's head is shifted. People at the head of the table are wondering if they're still at the head of the table. Jesus has gone. Now he's going to move down there. Have we missed out? Has our position changed? Is Jesus playing favorites now at the foot of the table? Did we sit where we sat in vain? What a difference this is from what we see in the book of Genesis. I want you to turn there, if you would, to Genesis, the 18th chapter. It's a neat story. You've probably read it before. Genesis, the 18th chapter, we're going to begin in verse 2, and I'm going to be reading from the New International Version today. Genesis chapter 18, beginning in verse 2. Are you there? Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, if I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not press your servant by, pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat and so that you can be refreshed and then go on your way. Now that you've come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. Um, isn't that a little different picture than what happened at the Last Supper? Notice that these men were strangers, and yet Abraham's first concern was that their feet have water. Now, I'm sure he had no clue at this point that the feet that he would wash were the feet of the one who would die for him. I'm sure he had no idea that the feet he was going to wash would be, at one time centuries later, the baby's feet of the Messiah. His most famous ancestor in a manger in Bethlehem. But he provided for their comfort without hesitation, in fact, with eagerness. He ran, it says, to do it. He provided for all their needs. And what did he call himself? He called himself a servant, their servant. Even though he was the head of his clan. Also, remember, it took Abraham 100 years to reach that point. He probably wasn't always that way. The disciples had not known Jesus for that long, but they had known him on a daily, face-to-face -face basis for three and a half years. They should have known better. Go to John, the 13th chapter, and, um, and look at that. Brother Benison read that to us just a little while ago. I was going to say Brother John read the words of John, but I thought maybe it sounded better to say Brother Benison in this case. And uh, beginning in... Verse 4, again, from the New International Version. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was around him. He came to Simon Peter. I picture Jesus coming to more the head of the table now. And that's probably where Peter would have been. I come 
he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And then a great transformation happens right here with Peter between verses 8 and 9. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath, or a baptism, we might say, needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. That was why he said not everyone was clean. And when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord. And rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. That's why Seventh-day Adventists observe the ordinance of foot washing or sometimes the ordinance of humility. Uh, I often refer to it, and I think it's in your bulletin, as the ordinance of cleansing. It's a special time. I like to imagine Jesus coming and washing my feet. And that I have the opportunity to wash Jesus' feet. Didn't Jesus say, as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. And so we have the privilege. After he took his place, I can imagine almost every disciple wished that he had been the one to get up and wash their feet. By the way, who do you think washed Jesus' feet that day? We don't have any record that anybody did, even after that. I'm sure they must have wished I had done that. I felt a tug in my heart. I should have done it. I knew I should have been the servant. But now the King of kings and Lord of lords, my Creator washed my feet. I wish I had moved away from my position and not been so concerned with being chief, the greatest. They wish they had moved away from this position to be a far better place, a place where Abraham had knelt centuries before at the feet of Jesus. So again today, Jesus calls us to do it again. Do you think... What is your place? What is your position? Are you willing to be a servant today? As we go to the fellowship hall in just a little bit, um, I encourage you to be a servant. Wash somebody's feet. If you don't know their name, learn their name and pray for them by name. Have a little prayer before you wash their feet. And think of them. Don't just think, oh, she's Zona. Think, she's Jesus. I get to wash his feet. If for some reason you are not comfortable going in to wash each other's feet, uh, you're welcome to come and observe, or you may remain here in the sanctuary until we come back and we're going to take of the bread and the wine of the communion service. Father in heaven, bless us as we go to wash each other's feet. As we become a servant, help us remember that Jesus, though the greatest who ever lived on this earth, became a servant for us. Help us also to be willing to be your servants. 
gladly washing each other's feet. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.